So this is part two of our video tutorial on the various types of organic chemical reactions for grade 12 chemistry. Uh, we'll start off with uh, the reactions of alkanes. So if you'll remember that alkanes are hydrocarbons that ha only have single bonds, so no double bonds or triple bonds allowed. Uh, the first reaction type we'll look at is the combustion of alkanes. So in the combustion of alkanes, there are two types, complete combustion as well as incomplete combustion. Now, it doesn't matter what type of alkane you have, so that's why I put question marks for the subscripts, because it could be C2H6 or C22H46. It really doesn't matter. As long as it's an alkane, and as long as you're reacting with excess oxygen, so plenty of oxygen, you will create, or produce rather, carbon dioxide gas, water, as well as heat. So this reaction is exothermic. Now, if, on the other hand, you don't have enough oxygen, so you have limited oxygen, you will instead produce carbon monoxide and carbon soot in addition to the original reactants. So yes, you will be able to produce carbon dioxide, so CO2. However, because you don't have enough oxygen to create CO2 all the time, you will create carbon monoxide, so one oxygen, carbon monoxide, as well as carbon soot, so ashes. All right? So the thing you need to remember is complete and incomplete combustion, exact same thing, except with carbon incomplete combustion, you get leftover crap like carbon monoxide and carbon soot. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, although many organic reactions are reversible, due to an exceedingly high activation energy, however, combustion reactions are not reversible. So once a hydrocarbon is burned, it cannot be converted back into its reactants. Uh, that's like saying if I had a propane tank and I started burning the propane, if I collected all the gases from the combustion reaction itself and try to jam it back together, can I create the original propane gas? Probably not. All right. The next type of reaction we want to look at is called cracking. Uh, this is where you turn an alkane into an alkene. This involves using heat to force the removal of hydrogen, creating an unsaturated product. So when I say unsaturated, uh, saturation basically means that you have filled all the carbons with all the atoms that they can take. So for instance, over here, this carbon has bonded as much as it can. All right? It's bonded to one methyl group over here, another methyl group here, as well as its two hydrogens. However, with this carbon, it has formed a double bond with this methyl group over here, and only one hydrogen. So I could break apart this uh, double bond and provide it with an extra bonding site with which to tack onto the hydrogen. So this one would be an example of a saturated hydrocarbon where I filled up everything uh, completely. There's no way I can tack on another atom at all. On the other hand, over here, this would be unsaturated, meaning that if I did break up this bond, this double bond over here, I could tack on an extra atom if I wanted to. So in order to create an alkene from an alkane, what we've essentially done is removed a hydrogen from one of these carbon, this carbon over here, and removed another hydrogen from this carbon over here, combined them together to create hydrogen gas. And in return, now that we have an extra bond on this site and an extra bond on this site, they both collapse together to form a double bond, which is what an alkene is defined as. Because heat is used, we put it above the arrow to show that heat is required for this reaction to go through. So if we look at my organic reactions flow chart, uh, for this video tutorial clip, we will be concentrating primarily on the reactions in the top left-hand corner over here. All right? uh, just now we are looking at the reaction of alkanes, how to turn them into alkenes. Notice how I write down heat produces hydrogen gas as well as an alkene. So again, heat produces hydrogen gas as well as the alkene. And of course, this process is known as cracking. This next type of reaction of an alkane is a type of substitution, and this one is called halogenation. So halogenation, the key word here is halogen. So what we're talking about is we're tacking on any of the elements on the group 7, or rather group 7A or group 17 of the periodic table. So that would be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Uh, not so much acetine because it's radioactive. And not so much iodine either because it's not very reactive. Primarily we'll be looking at fluorine, chlorine, and bromine. Which make up the halogen group. Hence the name halogenation. All right? So we're forming an alkyl halide where we have an alkane, alkene, or alkyne that has high, or rather... Um, a halogen attached onto it. That's why it's called a halide, alkyl halide. So the thing to keep in mind about halogenation is that although the CC bonds, the carbon-carbon bonds in alkanes are fairly hard to break, uh, that's because they are quite stable, this carbon-hydrogen bonds, however, can be broken fairly easily. This allows a halogen atom to take the place of the hydrogen. So in this case, we have a bromine molecule, 
symbolized with an X2, so X being any halogen, so it could, the X could be bromine, fluorine, or chlorine, sometimes iodine, uh, whereas the one of the bromine atoms over here substitutes for one of the hydrogens, and the hydrogen, of course, in this case, will bond with the bromine to form hydrobromic acid, or a hydrogen halide, so hydrobromic acid. Uh, in return, the bromine gets plopped onto this carbon over here, and it's been substituted in, and we now have an alkyl halide. So an alkane with a halogen attached to it, alkyl halide. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that although fluorine is pretty reactive, uh, it's actually one of the most reactive elements on the periodic table, as such, it readily reacts with uh, alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, bromine, chlorine, and iodine are not. They're not as reactive. As such, they do require heat or UV light in order to first break up the diatomic halogen before the reaction may proceed. So without uh, UV light or heat, this bromine molecule or chlorine or iodine will not break apart. If it does not break apart, you cannot substitute it in. All right? But once you do have heat or UV light present, uh, this bromine-bromine bond breaks apart, allowing one of the bromines to substitute in return, allowing uh, the production of our hydro uh, hydrobromic acid and also our alkyl halide. Furthermore, the alkyl halide that we have over here can be further halogenated by tacking on excess bromine. So if we added more bromine gas to the situation, we could continue to tack on more and more bromines around this carbon, substituting the hydrogen for bromine as we go along, of course, creating more hydrobromic acid in the process. Now, this example is pretty simple. I mean, the bromine can only tack to one of these two carbons. But what happens if you have a situation where you have multiple bond sites where the uh, halogen could be tacked on. What do we do? Where does it go? For this, we must first define what is a primary carbon, secondary carbon, and tertiary carbon. Now, primary carbon is symbolized with a one degree sign. A primary carbon is one that is bonded to, well, just one other carbon. A secondary carbon, on the other hand, has bonded to two other carbons. And of course, a tertiary carbon is bonded to three other carbons. Of course, there is a fourth one called a quaternary uh, carbon, four degree sign, where it is uh, bonded to four other carbons. However, in this picture over here, we only have uh, tertiary as the maximum that we've got. So please keep in mind that uh, primary carbons are the most stable, whereas quaternary technically is the least stable, but in this picture, uh, the tertiary is the least stable carbon available. Knowing this, uh, in cases of multiple substitution sites, the halogen will break the least stable carbon-hydrogen bond and attach itself to that carbon. So in this case over here, because the tertiary carbon over here is the least stablest, uh, the halogen will tack itself, itself onto this carbon over here. Looking carefully at this reaction, we have bromine. First, we break it apart with UV light or heat, which just allows us to have the uh, bromine ion attach itself onto one of the carbons. Now, which carbon do we choose? Well, this one is a primary. This one's also a primary. This one is a secondary carbon. Since primary is the most stable, secondary is le less stable than the uh, primary, this is where the halogen is going to be tacked on. So this hydrogen is going to be removed over here to form hydrobromic acid again. And then we've got the bromine tacking itself onto the least stable carbon. And there it is. So there you have it, the formation of an alkyl halide. Looking back at the organic uh, reactions flowchart, we see that alkanes can be converted into alkyl halides by substituting an X2. So X2 representing any halogen. All right? And in the process, you will produce a salt. And of course, I define a salt as any kind of hydrogen halide. Uh, so the HBr would be a, technically a salt. And we require heat or UV radiation in order to get this reaction going forward. So this reaction would be called halogenation. For our next reaction, we'll be looking at alkyl halides and alkenes and how they relate to each other and how we can convert them back and forth. Uh, one method would be through elimination reactions. So what you're doing is you're forming an alkene from an alkyl halide. So what happens is an alkyl, or rather a halide ion and its adjacent hydrogen are eliminated, which means they are removed, allowing a double bond to form between the carbons they were situated on. So for instance, over here, I've got my alkyl halide. Uh, the halogen ion and the hydrogen from opposite or different uh, carbons, they are going to be eliminated, removed from this molecule altogether. In return, we have extra bonds that are available, and these will collapse in on themselves to form a double bond. Now, this reaction must take place in the presence of a strong base. So in this case, I'm using sodium hydroxide. So a strong base, metal hydroxide. 
The purpose of the strong base is to provide a site for the bromine to bind onto. So the halogen will bond onto the sodium to create sodium bromide, my salt, which is a metal halide. And of course, there's our old friend water again. H and the OH will tack on to form water. So looking at my uh, overall organic reactions flow chart, we see that alkyl halides can be converted back into alkenes by eliminating. So whenever you see the negative sign over there, that means elimination or subtraction. So elimination of a hydrogen halide, HX, so whatever uh, halogen we're looking at, in the presence of a base will produce water as well as my salt in addition to my alkene as well. So it's a type of elimination reaction. So what happens if I want to go in the opposite direction, converting an alkene into an alkyl halide instead? Well, according to my flow chart, this process is known as halogenation, uh, because you're tacking on halogens from my alkenes, turn it into alkyl halide. And you can either use a diatomic halogen, X2, or you can use a hydrogen halide, HX. Notice how I'm using the plus sign to show that it's an addition reaction. And this reaction takes place at room temperature, so you don't need UV light or heat. So why is it that we don't need heat or UV light anymore? Well, essentially, multiple bonds are less stable than single bonds. Thus, alkenes and alkynes are generally more reactive than alkanes. Because of their reactivity, we don't need heat or UV light anymore. Uh, the double bond is so uh, unstable, compared to an, uh, a single bond anyway, that the uh, halogen no longer needs to be broken apart before it can tack onto itself. So in this case over here, when we are using an addition reaction of a X2, so any halogen 2, what happens is the single bond, or rather the double, is broken apart, allowing you to have two additional bond sites. These two bond sites are each taken by the two bromines. And that's where we have it over there. And once the double bond is gone, we're left with just a single bond and an alkane. So this is my alkyl halide. So we've just seen this route of uh, turning an alkene into an alkyl halide by adding on a diatomic halogen. But what if we decide to use a hydrogen halide instead? This process is known as hydrohalogenation. Again, you don't really need to have UV light or heat. The room temperature is uh, perfectly fine because of the unstable double bond. However, halogenation with a hydrogen halide has one problem. Yes, we do break apart the double bond, freeing up one side over here and one side over here. But where does the hydrogen go? Where does the bromine go? Where does the halogen go? Does it go on this one or does it go on this one? How do we know which one it goes on? This is where Markovnikov's rule comes into place. Uh, Markovnikov's rule essentially is summarized by the phrase, the rich get richer. Essentially, when a hydrogen halide or water is added to an alkene or alkyne, the hydrogen atom bonds to the multiple uh, bonded carbon or the multiple bonded carbon that already has more hydrogens. Meaning, look at this guy over here. This carbon has two hydrogens, whereas this carbon only has one hydrogen. According to Markovnikov's rule, the rich get richer. So, this hydrogen gets tacked on right here because it already had two hydrogens, this carbon over here, so it gets another hydrogen getting richer to three. This guy over here instead gets the halogen. All right, so Markovnikov's rule states the rich get richer. Whoever had more hydrogens gets the hydrogen. Whoever didn't have more hydrogens gets the halogen instead. So the next reaction we'll be looking at is the conversion of an alkene into an alcohol. So according to my flowchart over here, it looks like we have an addition reaction plus H2O to form an alcohol. This requires sulfuric acid as our catalyst, but we can also call it a hydration reaction because you're adding on water. So if you recall from uh, the first tutorial, a dehydration reaction is where you're subtracting or eliminating water, while the exact opposite would be hydration, where you're adding in water. So in the production of an alcohol, you are essentially adding on a hydroxyl group. Uh, over here, we have a double bond. Uh, once we break the double bond, we now have the ability to form two extra bonds over here. And so what happens when we add on the water is one of the H's over here and one of the hydroxyl groups will bond to one of these two locations. The question is, who goes where, though? This, of course, follows Markovnikov's rule. According to Markovnikov's rule, uh, the rich get richer. So whoever had more hydrogens gets the hydrogen. In this case, this carbon had two hydrogens. Whereas this carbon only has one hydrogen. If the rich get richer, then this hydrogen must go here, and the hydroxyl group goes here. Which is why we have an H attached here and a hydroxyl group attached here to create 2-propanol. Two 2-propanol two to represent that the uh, hydroxyl group is on the number 2 carbon. Of course, this uh, reaction requires sulfuric acid as a catalyst.